Good evening. Hi, everybody. I'm Stasha Brandon. I'm the program director here at Town Hall, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to this evening's event with E.O. Wilson, presented by Town Hall, Grist, and Elliott Bay Book Company as part of the Seattle Science Lectures, sponsored by Microsoft, with series media sponsorship provided by KPLU. Our program will run for about 45 minutes or so. Dr. Wilson is going to speak and then be joined by Grist's Chip Giller for an onstage conversation. After that, we'll have time for your questions. We ask that you come to the mics that are here at the edge of the stage so that we can pick you up for the recording that we're making, which, like about a third of our events, uh, may be made available to you through our media library that is up and running on our brand new website. So if you've missed an event or want to re-experience the one tonight, you can check there to watch the archive. I also want to take a minute to let you know that tonight's event is being live streamed, which is pretty exciting. And I, I got word that at least one high school assigned the live stream as homework, which I think is awesome, <laughs> right? After the Q&A, Dr. Wilson will sign books at the Elliott Bay Book Company table over on that side of the stage there, and our downstairs cafe space will stay open for another few minutes so you have a chance to hang out and chat about the talk uh, if you want to linger and, and uh, talk with other people that are ex experiencing the event tonight. So you may have noticed that we have duct tape on the carpets, and that doesn't look historic. <laughs> I want to let you know that's part of our new hearing loop system, which is a system that allows folks with most assisted listening devices to get direct audio feed of our lectures and concerts. It's a major step forward in accessibility for Town Hall, and we are honored to be one of the first, I think we actually are the first cultural venue in King County to install it. Now, the duct tape comes in because it's a temporary installation before we embark on a major renovation project in a couple of years when it will go under the carpet but we didn't want to wait to get it up and running. So if you are interested in learning more about the hearing loop system or if you have a T-coil and want to learn how to use it, you can chat with the patron services staff in the lobby. We also have, I think, a, a small number of um, loop systems that you can use if you want to experience that and you would just go to the lobby and they can hook you up. Before I introduce our guest, I wanted to mention a couple other events that are coming up um, as we wrap up this year. On Monday, December 15th, we'll welcome mathematician Andrew Hodges to remember the life and genius of pioneering computer scientist and cryptographer Alan Turing, who is the subject of the new Benedict Cumberbatch movie, The Imitation Game. Just to be clear, Benedict Cumberbatch is not coming. <laughs> but the wonderful Andrew Hodges is coming, and it's a wonderful book and really a comprehensive look at, at um, Turing's work and his legacy, and I think it's going to be a really fun event. And then on January 22nd, entrepreneur and author Andrew Keene will join us to talk about the benefits and costs of the internet to social and economic progress. That's looking ahead to next year. If you add to those programs some fantastic holiday concerts this month, a December 8th discussion on the concept of home with both of our uh, current residents, our um, scholar in residence Steve Scher and our artist in residence Alana Jacobs of Cabin Fever. And then we have a brand new year coming with folks like Patton Oswald um, and the Bushwick Book Club. You see what an eclectic and enlightening calendar we have for you here at Town Hall. And the best way to keep up with our programs is to become a member. Membership starts at just $45, and it offers downfront seating, discounts on book and ticket purchases, and a mailed copy of our monthly calendar. But more importantly, it provides essential support to bringing you more than 400 events annually, say like Dr. E.O. Wilson, at affordable ticket prices. So if you believe in Town Hall, please consider becoming a member. You can do that online at our brand spanking new website, townhallseattle.org, or you can chat with the patron services as you're heading out tonight. And now, here to introduce tonight's guest, and a bit le later appear in conversation with him, I'm delighted to welcome Chip Giller. Chip Giller founded Grist in 1999, intent on using a new type of journalism to engage the next generation on environmental issues. Grist, which publishes online, now has an audience of more than two million and has been especially successful reaching readers in their 20s and 30s. Readers follow grist.org for information, inspiration, and conversation, as well as an interjection of much needed humor. So please help me welcome Chip Geller. Uh, 
Uh, thanks, everyone, and um, I'm just I'm super excited about this evening. And um, you know, I think this is like a classically Seattle thing that we have a guest like E.O. Wilson, and this thing like sells out in a day, I think. So it's so it's pretty sweet. Um, we've been lucky enough to have Ed visit us at Grist a couple times, most recently this afternoon. So I know we're all in for a treat tonight uh, with the conversation. Um, but before we get to the heart of our discussion, I wanted to share a couple of thoughts. Um, and here's one of my favorite E.O. Wilson quotes. Uh, it goes like this. The origin of modern humanity was a stroke of luck. Good for our species for a while, bad for the most of, rest of the rest of life forever. <laughs> <laughs> so this quote to me is all kinds of things at once. Absolutely true, deeply sad, darkly funny, and maybe, just maybe, it offers us the tiniest bit of optimism. Um, each of us in this room is complicit in this thing called humanity. This mass of people and ideas and business dealings and corruption and artistic endeavors and love and hate and all sorts of other things. As our guest tonight so rightly points out, and as is obvious if we just look around, humans are pretty rough on the planet. There's no denying it. We step on the small things and we've even managed to mess with vast global systems. So we're not easy on this blue orb but we're also the best chance we've got to fix the mess we've made, and we have to find a way. At Grist, we cover climate change and threats to biodiversity and the challenges in front of us, but we also make sure to cover the people who are changing things, taking action, building new routes to sustainability, creating policies that make more sense. We want those people to get the attention they deserve, and we want other people to follow their lead. Given how badly humanity has already screwed up the road ahead is not going to be easy, but it's a road we must travel. My hope is that we can travel it with grace and gratitude, that we can find solutions to our greatest challenges without the destruction and thoughtlessness that has marked our kind thus far. Ed says the origin of modern humanity was bad for most of the rest of life forever, and I can't say I disagree, but I guess I cling to the hope that we have it within us to make some adjustments to that legacy. So I look forward to hearing uh, our distinguished guests' latest thinking about this and other matters. Um, but first, just a few words of proper introduction. Um, Ed Wilson is one of our greatest scientists and communicators of our time. A professor emeritus at Harvard, he is considered a father of sociobiology, island biogeography, and the concept of biodiversity. He is also the world's leading authority on ants. His groundbreaking research, original thinking, and scientific and popular writing have changed the way humans think of nature and our place in it. Ed has written more than 20 books, won two Pulitzer Prizes and countless other awards, and discovered hundreds of new species. In his newest book, The Meaning of Human Existence, he unravels our place in the cosmos philosophically and scientifically and the challenges we face. So please welcome to the stage E.O. Wilson. Thank you. Um, I'm going to remain seated, not because um, I'm, um, what, too casual, but I, I got weak knees, you know. You reach, uh, you start getting weak knees at a certain age, and your dreams of uh, running the four-minute mile at long last fade. <laughs> well, I'm grateful to uh, the town uh, uh, hall, uh, Seattle, uh, for this invitation and the opportunity to come back to Seattle, uh, one of the best towns uh, in the world for the quality of life and for uh, its devotion to the things I care about, which is conservation. How could you not be uh, in love with nature in a place like this? Uh, also for um, the hospitality of Chip Giller, who was just here, and his remarkable organization, Grist. Uh, now, uh, Paul Gauguin, in his uh, Tahitian masterpiece, 
He finished just before, in his plan, he would commit suicide, and that would be the end of him, but he didn't. But I don't want to go into that story, as interesting as it is. They, what I wanted to do was to tell you or remind you of the title of his, uh, uh, his great Tahitian masterpiece, uh, which uh, was the Three Questions. That was the title of uh, this great painting. Uh, and the three questions were, are, they're in the upper left-hand corner of the canvas, where do we come from, where are we, uh, what are we, and where are we going? Now, uh, let us pause for this evening, for the remainder of the evening, and think about those three questions. These happen to be the three central questions of religion and philosophy. Through millennia, we've thought and argued about the first two of these questions. Where do we come from? What are we? Uh, will we ever be able to solve them? Will we ever be able to penetrate uh, the uh, uh, mysterium grandis uh, for answers? And sometimes it seems not, uh, yet perhaps we can. Now, religion, I have to say, is, will never provide the answers. Uh, the reason is that each organized religion, each faith, and there are hundreds of them around the world, uh, has its own different creation story. A story of um, you know, how everything came to be. In other words, a story of what is the meaning of humanity. It's in competition with all the others with their creation stories. And each creation story was written in times and circumstances. Uh, we should keep in mind when the authors knew almost nothing about the universe, the planet, life on Earth, or the prehistory of the human condition. Um, each one uh, considers its creation story uh, in answer to where do we come from and what are we and where are we going to be set in stone and superior to all the others, as gentle, as giving, as, uh, as democratic and everything else uh, as it is, uh, and of high morale, uh, moral um, uh, direction, it nevertheless feels it's superior to all others. Each was born from the dreams and speculations of shamans and prophets from another era. Uh, they can't all be correct. No two can be correct. None, in fact, is consistent with our growing knowledge of the universe, the planet, life on Earth, or the prehistory of the human condition. Uh, we also look in vain to philosophy for the answer to the riddle. Uh, despite its noble purpose in history, despite its effectiveness in training the mind to inquire and think logically, uh, professional secular philosophy uh, long ago gave up trying to answer uh, this uh, overarching question, uh, what is the meaning of life, uh, which we break into three questions, just noted. Most of the history of philosophy is unfortunately strewn with the wreckage of theories of the conscious mind. After uh, the decline of logical positivism uh, in the middle of the last century, after this attempt to join science and logic into a closed system of logical reasoning, philosophers have scattered into an intellectual diaspora, into those areas not yet colonized by science, uh, into <laughs> Intellectual history, well, that's, you know, that's what uh, one uh, great scientist put it, or a philosopher, he said, Philosoph uh, science is what we know and philosophy is what we don't know. Uh, at any rate, uh, uh, it's uh, scattered into intellectual history, uh, in semantics, that's what you learn when you take philosophy uh, nowadays in universities. Uh, in foundational mathematics, that's a good one, ethics, and most profitably uh, into problems of personal life adjustment. Now, by default, then, the solution to the great riddle has been left to science, to knowledge of the real world that can be tested and shared with the, every, every person. What science promises, and it's already supplied in part, is the following. There is a real creation story, 
uh, of uh, humanity, and there's only one, and it is not a myth. It's being worked out and tested and enriched and strengthened step by step. So what I'm going to attempt in this brief account tonight is to tell you that story. I'm going to make it an abstract, actually, so I'll have a chance to, uh, uh, to chat back and forth uh, with uh, uh, Mr. Gillen uh, and then with you. Uh, but I'll attempt in this brief account to tell you that story as I think it's coming into focus. It comes together from multiple disciplines, from molecular genetics, from neuroscience, from evolutionary biology, to ecology, uh, to archaeology, to social psychology, and history. Those are the particular disciplines of the academic world, uh, the world of knowledge, from which the picture is emerging. And now, increasingly, uh, the, um, uh, the whole field of artificial intelligence united with the drive for a complete map of human activity. You have a very important laboratory doing that right here in Seattle at the present time. Uh, mapping is a part of the BAM, the Brain Activity Mapping Program. Uh, and uh, this uh, uh, is one of the areas that is going to be contributing the most, I think, to close in on the grail of biology, or at least behavioral biology, neurobiology. The grail is the physical basis of consciousness. Uh, but I want to put that aside for the moment. And so what is the meaning of life, of human existence? And I'll suggest that certainly that's the sort of thing you would ask me from the title of this book that we're selling here, you know, the meaning of human existence. And uh, so um, I would say the short answer is history. But it's also prehistory. It recognizes that history in the conventional sense, and particularly history uh, that began uh, with uh, some vigor and, uh, and directness of description from, uh, with literacy, that history in the conventional sense makes no sense without prehistory. That is to say, uh, we came into the Neolithic 10,000 years ago, and then uh, only uh, 3,000 years ago or so, did we begin to write and leave a literate record of history. Um, in only a very thin, uh, short period of time, and we uh, then, in order to understand what that history is, we really need to know what human nature is and what the history was prior to uh, the beginning of conventional history. So um, history makes no sense without prehistory, without the story of the ancestry of the human species and the circumstances under which it evolved and what ecological forces drove the natural selection of its evolution and the, uh, the oddities, the accidental events, and the so on that brought through the first large creature on Earth that can think uh, and create a full uh, cognizant and transferable culture. And then history, we come to realize that history makes no sense without biology. Because you have to understand just what biology is, what is changing, what the genes are involved how they are affecting the formation of the nervous system and the sensory system and the foundational activity of our emotional responses and the like. So to make this uh, and try to define it uh, is um, we have to recognize, and this is what I'll do as quickly as I can, um, that, the, uh, that there exists a very high level of social complexity called you sociality. Uh, that's E-U and sociality. And you know, that means literally true social behavior. 
And that means, uh, specifically, the existence of groups over multiple generations, they persist over multiple generations, these groups, those same individuals and their offspring and their grand offspring, in which adult members rear the young in a cooperative manner. Um, and they vary their longevity or their reproduction rate or both in ways that altruistically enhance the complexity of social organization and the survival and the reproduction and the spread of the group. That's called group selection. Now there are countless thousands of animal species that form social groups and some are quite dramatic uh, such as a chimp, uh, a chimp pansy group or a flock of starlings, but almost all of these fall short of youth sociology. That is, they lack a consistent division of reproduction and labor with some elements of altruism worked into the uh, production of cooperation. In fact, and this is something I've just recently established, reasonably recently established, with a few others by s surveying social behavior as it is known across the entire animal kingdom, and including fossil records and you know, histories as best we can work them out. True use so sociology, uh, of which we are a species that uh, possess it, True use sociology, Ali, has originated on the terrestrial part of the planet only very rarely. To be precise, as far as we know, only 20 times in the history of uh, the, uh, the Earth of which we have record. It's variously, it has originated variously in the several kinds of insects, uh, it's several times in the insects, twice in the mole rats of Africa, a strange place to find it, and once in the human line. And it didn't happen at all until quite late in the Mesozoic era when termites, of all things, first developed it uh, some 150 million years ago. And it came actually rather late in the geological history of uh, the spread and diversification of life on the planet. And finally, and strikingly, this is a really important point, it is in this very small array of evolutionary lines that the numerically most abundant and ecologically dominant creatures are to be found. Advanced social creatures rule the land. Uh, then you may have asked, what is someone who has spent his life working on ants doing talking about us? Well, the reason is that ants and, um, and humans share two important things. They're both eusocial, and they both dominate their part of the biosphere. Ants are the, by far the most, uh, the lar the most abundant and uh, in biomass heaviest uh, group of, of small creatures on the land. Uh, just for your delectation, I can tell you, we can make a rough estimate that if you took all the human beings uh, alive today and weighed them, and you took all of the ants alive today at any given moment, uh, the weights would be approximately the same. Now, that has no significance whatsoever <laughs> because, uh, <laughs> because we are, uh, but at any rate, it'll give you a sense of. Um, you know, who rules the world uh, right now, at least the, uh, the terrestrial world. Um, in the African example, uh, the savannah, uh, there are four times um, uh, of uh, ants uh, than there are in, in uh, weight uh, than all of the vertebrates, birds, mammals, amphibians, uh, and reptiles uh, together. Uh, now this is the setting, I think, that we need to begin to understand the origin of humanity. And here are the specific questions 
that biologists and anthropologists are just beginning to address. This is the science part. And I should add, concerning the books that I've been writing, that the one out now uh, that has just appeared um, is attempts to answer the second of the two questions, uh, and that is, what are we? The book uh, published two years before that, The Social Conquest of Earth, was the attempt to answer the first of the questions on Gauguin's painting, which is, where do we come from? And I've just finished the third, uh, and hope to publish it uh, by uh, the beginning of 2016, accepted by W.W. W. Norton, which is gonna take a stab at where are we going. Uh, and that is going to be um, an all out effort I'm making with the help of a lot of people uh, to come up with something radically new and uh, far more powerful than we have tried up to the present time to save the rest of life is hemorrhaging away. Even with the best efforts we've been putting in through mainstream conservation efforts, uh, even though that's been growing in strength and getting more and more public support, that hemorrhaging of species is such that we're still losing uh, species to extinction um, at approximately somewhere between 100 and 1,000 times base level. And that's the level that it was at before humans appeared. Uh, and that was, uh, at that pre-human level, was about one species going extinct per million species per year. And now it's rapidly approaching 1,000. And there are reasons I, I don't, I can't cover now, uh, but uh, we're beginning to understand why it, it's, we're having such a hard time slowing it down, even with our best efforts. The important point is that uh, most agree that if we don't stop the hemorrhaging, uh, we will have as many as one half of the species of organisms on Earth, at least macro or above microbes, uh, extinct or uh, on the brink of extinction by the end of the century. At any rate, uh, so that's the idea of this trilogy I've been uh, working on. Um, the first great evolutionary wave of insects was about 400 million years ago. The dragonflies, mayflies, beetles swarmed among strange insect forms now long extinct. In the middle of this exuberant evolution, there was no sign of eusociality in the insects of the invertebrates. First ants and termites uh, appeared beginning about 150 million years ago. But in the Mesozoic, there were no eusocial vertebrates, in spite of the fact that there were a number of likely candidates among the dinosaurs, not ones that were bi, uh, bipedal and seemingly were anatomically candidates for uh, the, uh, the, the kind of cerebral development that uh, led to humanity. Uh, now, what was the step that took us over the uh, threshold? What generally is the threshold to eusociality? In every worked out case, uh, it is this. The rearing of the young by a female or mated pair in a carefully constructed nest from which the parents forage for uh, food to feed the young in left in the nest progressively, raising them to maturity. Now that's a rather uncommon in the animal kingdom, but uh, what's of interest is that whenever a, uh, a line went, one of those 20 lines went over and actually created eusocial societies, it was from that position. There, that is the necessary pre-adaptation. That is the threshold you have to reach. Many species have reached it, although they're still rare compared to the rate variety of all other kinds of species, but only a few. Uh, uh, many are called, but only a few are chosen. Many, uh, uh, many, uh, 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 
came to the threshold but didn't uh, cross it. Now I'm going to quickly just refer to primary research to trace the steps. Uh, and I hope time is going to, uh, I'm not running too much over time. Uh, and um, to tell you what happened in the case of humans. Um, first, there, it's, uh, not long after the division of the human line uh, from the chimp line, which was about six million years ago, we went bipedal um, and, um, and then proceeded much later uh, to depart from the chimps further in the amount of culture we have. Chimps have cultures. That is, as you go from population to population, you find one population uh, in which they've invented uh, fishing, another in which they have uh, invented uh, s spear or stone throwing, and so on. Uh, but they haven't then gone very far with that. Uh, now, from one of the species of uh, the um, human line that was destined to lead to humanity, the so-called um, Australopithecines, an evolutionary line developed that lifted not just Australopithecines, our a group of species among which one was to be our ancestors, uh, that lifted uh, life as a whole, and this is us, to an entirely new level. And that occurred beginning about three million years ago and was manifested in the dramatic increase in brain size, particularly the memory storing regions of the cortex. Prior to this time, the pre-human brain size, which is that of a chimp, was about 400 to 500 cubic centimeters, approximately the size of a brain of a chimpanzee. Then, brain size increased, began increasing dramatically, suddenly, at what's possibly the fastest rate of growth for any complex organ ever. Now, what was going on? What was causing this rapid evolution. The crucial event, it appears, it's emerging as a consensus among scientists who study uh, the, this period of human evolution. Um, at this time, uh, the species was, the brain was big enough to put it in the genus Homo, and that's when we found, uh, we find the habilines, they're called Homo habilis and Homo ergaster, two species of which one then went on to Homo sapiens. What happened to these habilines was that they, for the first time, shifted substantially to a consumption of meat, a greater consumption than any other species had done. And very likely they had been feeding occasionally on small animals, but in addition, at best guess, they shifted reliance to animals of all kinds, killed at first by lightning strike, struck ground fires, Meat, if you can get it energetically, more efficient per gram. And cooked meat, which is available to them as fire killed, is easier, easier to eat and digest. What began the runaway growth of brain size was not just the consumption of meat, it was the way meat is harvested. And animals that live in groups and hunt uh, typically do so from dens, from nests, uh, and wild dogs, for instance, and wolves, where some stay to protect the young, others hunt for prey. And that's what our ancestors undoubtedly did. And we have evidence that they were certainly doing it by the time of Homo erectus, which was the immediate pre predecessor of, of a couple of million years ago to modern Homo sapiens. Uh, in two to three million years ago, we are fairly certain that pre-humans, these Australopith, um, uh, early Homo, were creating campsites. They started using, in effect, protected nests, just like all of the other lines. In other words, they came to the threshold of eusociality and great promise, shall we say, just as in other known species of organisms that reach and cross the threshold for which we can confidently reconstruct this event. This is a rule without known exception among the 20 animal species of which we have knowledge. 
When you live in close contact in the same place, when you no longer travel about in loose groups searching for vegetable food, as do, say, chimpanzees, then you divide labor. Then the reading of intention among cooperating adults becomes vital. Then understanding from body language and facial expression and vocalization of what, uh, from which you read intention, intention of what others want and will do, you develop cooperation based upon social intelligence. Social intelligence is the key uh, into uh, the uh, further evolution of our species, our particular line, uh, and we developed it to an extremely high degree. That is why uh, we focus, one of the reasons we focus so much on the creative arts and on each other. We find of each other the most interesting things in the world. Uh, people love to see people. They love to think about people. They love to gossip. Uh, we're, we are, I'm sorry to say, so far developed in that way uh, that we can, uh, now we are actually just taking over the earth and destroying it because of our narcissistic uh, view of humanity caused by the way we evolved in the first place. Please think about that as a proposition. In other words, this is something we've developed because that's how you develop you sociality. And uh, it is, was fundamental to the way we came into existence. And unfortunately, that makes us a dysfunctional species. What I like to, how I like to put it is uh, that um, uh, because of our, the way we were created, we are still Paleolithic, you know, uh, Stone Age in our emotions. We're still medieval in our institutions and we have godlike technology. We have, gone, we have become extremely dangerous. By the time of Homo erectus, uh, the uh, campsites were well developed, fire had been controlled, stone tools had been adopted, and humanity uh, was on its way uh, to, like that asteroid that slammed into the Yucatan coast uh, 60, um, Five thousand million years ago, and caused the earth to be rung like a bell uh, and wipe out uh, the creatures of the Mesozoic. We've slammed into the earth, and we haven't figured out uh, what to do about it and where to stop or how to stop or how to think about ourselves. And that's why these questions that I've been asked, whether I've answered them correctly or not, and others working. Uh, up through science and collaboration, in some cases, I'm happy to say with humanities scholars, uh, we, we, need, we need together, uh, and all of us need together to develop a clearer picture of where do we come from, where we came from, what we are, and where we're going. Now, I've thrown a lot of at you, so let me conclude this very abbreviated form. I've probably run over my time. Anyway, as follows. The overall perception of the origin of the human condition throws light, and it's destined to throw a lot more light, I believe, uh, on the origins of culture, on the origins of language, morality, religion, and the creative arts of the kind that are now well underway by many scholars in various fields. We are about to enter a new phase of learning in which the great uh, divisions of learning uh, natural science, social science, and humanities are going to come together. It offers promise, uh, these new directions we're taking, and the taking more seriously of what we are and what we're doing to the planet, uh, offers promise that the three bridge branches of learning uh, will be linked in the future in a new and interesting manner. And I very much appreciate your having me here and listening to me this, this evening.
Thank you, Ed, for that profound, uh, those, those remarks. Um, so I have, a, I have a series of questions that may not always be so profound, but I have a series of questions and then we want to open it up to you guys uh, to ask questions as well. Um, but just to start with sort of a quick question, Ed, um, you know, as someone who's so intricately familiar with ants and insects, I imagine you have some favorites out there. And I just wondered if you could tell us your current favorite ant and why. Um, well, it would have to be, uh, and you know, that's not a trivial question. I know, because a um, question for you. Where, where, um, where we uh, have come so far uh, with um, authentic culture and being able to create in each individual immense memory banks, ants, which, have, which are one millionth our size and brains the size scarcely of a pinprick, um, have to do it all with instinct. And whatever advanced social behavior they have is based upon pure instinct. Uh, they don't have much in the way of learning capacity, but with pure instinct, they've done some remarkable things. And the summit of evolution in ant biology for your delectation, and for those of you who make it into the American tropics, I mean the New World tropics, um, and see these long lines of ants carrying fragments of leaves, would you please raise your hand if you've seen, any, seen that? I think a lot of it, yes. That's one of the great wonders of the natural world. And because these are uh, agricultural ants, these leaf-cutting ants, uh, each colony contains about five million workers. Mm. They're all female. Uh, they are all the daughters of one queen mm. that lives to about 15 years. Wow. I know because I have kept colonies from the beginning to the death of the queen. <laughs> A couple of colonies and others have. They live about as long as an average dog. Uh, and during that period of time, a queen produces about 150 million uh, daughters. Wow. But that immense number of, of, of daughters and aunts do the following by instinct, by cooperative behavior that is tightly organized uh, by instinct. They build an immense nest which goes as deep as 20 feet in the ch channel. The, the nest is um, constructed as an air conditioning unit. That is to say they have big central air channels that go out and lead exhausted air through the top. They have uh, channels on all around the side that take in, in fresh air and it's pulled in by convection of used air and heated air and you have a constant circulation that keeps the temperature uh, at about uh, 90 degrees and the level of CO2 just a little above, and so on. But most importantly, uh, they are agricultural. They, uh, they go and collect these leaves and fragments of leaves uh, and bring them back to the nest. And then they have assembly lines, which uh, through a series of casts specialized for different tasks, you know, just like a human yeah. assembly line, uh, they masticate and process the leaf fragments and then build gardens that look like honeycombs of this mash material, uh, fundamental, you know, very highly processed material. And then they plant fungus on it. And the fungus grows up very rapidly and that's what they eat. They live on fungi. So they'd be your favorite yeah. ant at the moment. Yeah. I was going to, I made all those details because I want you to go away uh, maybe with a little species less esteem for your species, but more esteem for ants. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, I wanted to ask, sort of in studying some of the smallest beings on the planet, did you always draw lines to bigger questions of existence? Or is it only more recently uh, in this stage of your career, looking back over the aggregate of, aggregate of your work, that these sort of big questions have come to mind? Um, when I was a young scientist, I did, I think, the right thing to do. Uh, that is to say, um, uh, I was hunting 
for big questions and uh, that uh, if I could answer them, it would be an important advance and discovery. One of the first I did work on was uh, the chemical language of the ants. Mm. Uh, we had just had the birth then of ethology, which is the scientific study of instinctive behavior, primarily of animals. And when I heard that uh, uh, lectures by the key founders of this field and listened to them talk about uh, how triggering stimuli in sound and um, in color uh, uh, and pattern made uh, release and cause complex behavior, instinctive behavior that helped build up uh, the repertories of fish and uh, birds. I asked myself, what about ants? Is it possible that ants do the same thing with smell? So I went for that, and that's all I cared about. I, was, mm -hmm. I worked with chemists, and we worked out, we broke the pheromone code of ants, and we, over a period of time, a number of people working in the field showed there were 10 to 20 basic uh, pheromones that they pass in different glands in the body. They can combine them together to make almost like a sentence. They can put them in a different context to make this meaning specific. They can release different quantities, each level of which is another message, and they can talk. So that was the kind of science I did. But it was only later that I started putting a lot of this material together mm -hmm. in a field called sociobiology. Of course, <clears throat> I nearly got uh, driven out of Harvard uh, for <laughs> suggesting that human beings have instincts. <laughs> in the 1970s, right. um, this was dogma in the social, inst uh, social sciences, yeah. that human beings are entirely uh, programmed by learning, by their culture, by circumstance. There was no such thing as instinct. Um, and, um, uh, well, uh, I was right. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. So, um, <clears throat> just to leave ants for a moment, um, you, you write a lot about potential dangers and possibilities from scientific advancement. And we talked a little bit about this earlier today, but I'm curious, which technologies and lines of research do you find most threatening, and which, which sort of technologies are you finding most promising and are you most optimistic about right now? First, uh, the most threatening, that's easy, nuclear weapons. I think we need to do a lot more about nuclear weapons than we have been. I hope the next yeah. president and Congress uh, will eventually take it up as a major serious issue, uh, start being serious about knocking, uh, bringing down those uh, armament uh, uh, that we have stockpiled. Well, the best, uh, I'm going to surprise you, is robotics and mm. artificial intelligence. Uh, that's the future. It's a, what I call the BNR spearhead of innovative industry from science and technology. That's biology, including medicine, uh, in this for nanotechnology. That's for, for miniaturization. Uh, and R is for robotics. I think most people understand there's something extremely important that's happening now in the advance of, of um, artificial intelligence in something called the whole brain emulation studies in which we're trying to find out just how the brain works in order to translate in, in some labs, in order to translate that information into ever more human-like uh, powerful computers. And um, so what this does in effect, it has a lot of effects, but for the field of conservation, what it's doing is it's going to shrink the size of the ecological footprint. That is the amount of land and, and, and energy and materials required for a, a nevertheless high standard of living for each human, but to constantly shrink that amount down. And that's, since we're not, we're gonna hardly stop, uh, we're gonna begin to stop, I think, around 10 billion people. That's far too many, you know, for uh, the Earth uh, under its present natural resource content 
and uh, sustainable what would that be more cycling. Like two billion, or what would what, what could I, the Earth? I think what we will we are going to be able to do uh, is uh, is to reduce uh, radically the uh, amount of space, energy, and materials required by people through these innovative yeah. approaches, and that will change the whole ball game. I think that's going to happen. Um, yeah. You know, getting back to the nuclear apocalypse, I'm just wondering, is it true that cockroaches would survive? The what? <laughs> I was just echoing back to what you were saying about nuclear weapons as being the most fearful technology. I'm just, is it true that cockroaches would survive an apocalypse? I, I don't think so. Okay. I'll That's of some comfort. Uh, but ants will. <laughs> uh, and I'm just, <laughs> and I'll, I'll tell you uh, very quickly about uh, an experiment. Yeah, please. Uh, that was uh, carried on um, 30, 40 years ago at the Brookhaven Laboratory on Long Island. Uh, it was very simple. Uh, an enclosure was sealed off with uh, extreme security, and uh, a, um, a lethal quantity of strontium-90 was then lowered into, uh, a, uh, into a pit. A, a tube going into the earth and, and occasionally would be brought up, or according to schedule, would be brought up and allowed to radiate everything within that ex uh, exposure. And everything died, you know, the, all the plants withered and fell down brown. Nothing occurred on, except ants. And what ants were doing was they were subterranean and they were coming up just for short periods of time and picking up the dead creatures that had <laughs> you know, been killed by the radiation, and they were carrying on. Yay so, ants. What? I said yay ants. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, um, there'll, be, there'll be something left of biodiversity if we have nuclear war. Um, so let's go to another plane for a second. Um, you, you've said you believe extraterrestrial beings exist, and they likely possess moral qualities the ability to care, be altruistic, and be generous. Um, can you say a bit more about that? Because I just find that really provocative. And yeah, this is not Hollywood yeah. speaking. <laughs> um, this is based upon uh, the, what I was just generalizing about. Yeah. You know, the finding that uh, it's still controversial, but I think we're prevailing in this way of interpreting the data, uh, that uh, what is uh, extremely important in the origin of advanced social behavior, which almost certainly, given enough time, enough hundreds of millions of years on uh, the Goldilocks planets that do occur, and they must occur uh, in the galaxy as a whole by the millions, maybe billions. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, so if our experience with Earth for those 20 lines that we understand now of what really could go to the next level up in the organization of society. Uh, if that holds elsewhere, and why would it not, then they're going to uh, be pushed over the threshold and into advanced social behavior by group selection, mm -hmm. not by individual selection of competition within societies. Now, group selection uh, has a remarkable uh, property that it can create uh, authentic altruism. Uh, it, can it can actually uh, 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 generate uh, the, um, uh, the, the restraint of expansion, including population expansion based upon reason and far-sighted uh, projections. Uh, this is a point that is beginning to be picked up, and, and therefore you would expect it to occur on other planets, really. Uh, this is a point that is being picked up, not for extraterrestrials, but you know, for the origin of human, the better angels of our nature. We, Darwinian selection was uh, theory was not explaining that, but I think we are now doing it. Um, but, uh, and this uh, then is the reason why uh, more and more people, Jonathan Haidt, for example, sure. the University of Virginia, 
is one who's begun to write in this direction, uh, is that there's a perfectly rational and very solid basis for the origin of, well, we'll just call them a better, angels of our nature. And that, to me, is very encouraging. I, I didn't try to help that body of theory along uh, with that in mind, but it was, it's a happy consequence of it. Got it. Um, so, so back here on Earth, uh, I, um, you came to the Grist office a couple years ago uh, when the Social Conquest book came out, and you, you immediately wanted to know of my staff, um, and, and, and you asked our, my staff, my younger staff, and, and, and you asked of us and our millennial readers, why, weren't, why wasn't there more protesting in the streets about conservation issues and no. environmental issues, and why, doesn't the, why didn't the movement of today look a little bit more like the 60s? So I'm kind of curious what your thoughts are on this now, uh, given the recent climate march in New York City and similar events. Do you feel like the environmental movement and conservation movement is getting a little bit of its mojo back? And do you think protesting is an effective way to push the needle on these vast global issues? Uh, I, I, I do sense. Um, I can't really get a grip on it or measure it. But I, I know we had an earlier conversation, and yeah. I think we're agreed that something's going on. And I, I believe you'll find the source, the wellspring of it, this time not a, um, a hateful war, as we were in before, but it's of a generation uh, that is frightened, even a well-educated uh, generation, uh, is frightened that there's not going to be a real good place for them, that something's going wrong with the way we have society organized, that capitalism really has had uh, free capitalism as having you know, the increase of, of, uh, de of, of, of inequality and uh, that going to college is no longer a guarantee of a job and all these things, yeah. uh, and they're right. Uh, they like to have something more that they can identify with and participate in and live with and think that they are participating in progress. And when you ask, if you ask uh, our species, this, uh, you know, this dysgenic, um, uh, disoriented species we are now, uh, what would be the result that all our science and our technology uh, and progress and faith in ourselves, where is it leading us? Comfortable, long lives, security, uh, opportunity for a gen adventure, uh, lots of sex with reproduction being optional. <laughs> uh, and, uh, you know, a few others. And that's what we want everybody to have. Yeah. But the problem is that that's also the goals of your family dog. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, I, I, look to, I look to this generation to be maybe the first one that says, what are the right goals for us as a species yeah. living on this planet? Um, so I'm going to ask you two more <laughs> questions, and then we'll turn it to the audience, turn over to the audience, and we have mics here for you guys. Um, one question I have is, you know, you're, you're, I think you're in a room full of admirers now, and I'm wondering, who is it that you admire most who's sort of doing cutting-edge science or, or thinking right now? And in particular, I wanted to ask, you know, there's a lot of talk and focus and emphasis now on getting more women into science fields. Nope. So I'm curious if you have any thoughts um, or if you've had any female colleagues who've been particularly influential on your thinking and research. We were just talking about Rachel Carson, for example, in the back room. Yeah, sure. I, I, I'm proud of the fact uh, that I'm, according to her biographer, the one of only two people who actually worked with her. And that might sound weird, but no, the, she was working in the 60s, early 60s, when I corresponded with her, I helped her out on the fire ant situation. Uh, but certainly, um, these are people who could see further, 
uh, and actually do something about it yeah. uh, that uh, would be high on my list. And, uh, Are there any emerging rock stars that we should be aware of? What? Any emerging rock stars such as yourself whom we should be aware of? I'm not a rock star. Okay. <laughs> it's fair enough, uh, fair enough. I'm a naturalist. <laughs> <laughs> At any rate, um, yeah. I, well, I, you know, I want to see, um, I, I want to see genius among the young people. That's why I wrote this book, uh, Letters to a Young Scientist, yeah. uh, to yeah. uh, tell them how to be a success in science. And I want to see many more coming into science and technology and idealistically yep. um, who uh, find it a triumph to make an advance in technology or a scientific discovery uh, that really helps humanity. I've become friends just recently. We're, I live in a retirement community in Lexington, yep, your hometown. Where I grew up. Yeah. Coincidence. And may have passed you in the street many times. Yes. Uh, but, um, and, and one of my friends is Bill Harris. Uh, Harris hip. Women and men both walk because of the Harris hip. We just need uh, replacement. We need so much more of that. Yeah. Uh, I would like to see uh, advances in neurobiology include uh, at long last, uh, the uh, regeneration of severed nerve cords, and so on. There's sure. so many things to do. Sure. And I'd like to really feel that this generation sees a future in that. that uh, it's not just to be a success in life and make a good salary and have a Mercedes, you know, and so on, uh, but that they might be in on the great advances in technology and science. And of course, as far as women's right is concerned, I think the, um, the doors of, of American science and technology are now wide open or nearly wide open to women. We need more minorities. But that's a problem not of closed doors, due to closed doors in science and technology, but uh, the fact that they don't have the gut, they don't have uh, a fair starting point, mm -hmm. you know, in the, mm -hmm. in the race uh, to succeed there. Um, and uh, so, so, Ed, let me ask you so, one last question before you open up to the audience. I'm yeah. curious, is there kind of uh, one thing you want lodged in people's minds as they make their way home tonight? I'm thinking earlier today you talked to me about the theme of your th the third book in the trilogy, uh, Half Earth, and, and if you wanted to introduce that concept here. Well, the third book that I, I have is, uh, it's pro, it has a proposal uh, that now is in the title, I may be changed, called Half Earth. And that's uh, the transcendent moral principle, letting alone the rest of nature to go on evolving and you know, sustaining the world for us automatically without us interfering with it one way or the other. Uh, and that we make this a moonshot. Yeah. That it's a goal that people can immediately understand, that it can be branded with a name, like Half Earth, and that it's um, something to work for and declare when it is pretty nearly finished. And moreover, as I hope I'm showing in the next book, and I hope you'll allow me back even. <laughs> We'd enjoy it. You know, if, 2016. If, if, oh, thank you. I didn't mean that. I, uh, <laughs> All right. Well, <laughs> I, sorry. Yeah, let's take that some was, questions. Let's take that some was questions. in politics uh, that, uh, you know, we can be talking about this now. And that is what I think uh, we need to do is to find a way to stop the emerging of species uh, extinction, which we have not stopped. And we haven't found out a way to stop it. Yeah. And we need to take something that is really radically new and go for it. So let's take a few questions starting here, and I'll rotate back and forth. And just the general comment, ask a question, please, and not make a speech. I will Hello? Yeah, I, I can't hear. Yeah, it hasn't. It's not on. Sharing this evening with us and for all of your contributions to humanity. As I heard you talk about our carnivorous ancestors, 
I started to wonder whether or not veganism was an evolutionary dead end. Yes. Would you repeat that? The okay. question is, is veganism an evolutionary dead end? Or, or, sh or should we all be striving to be vegans to where we respect uh, the lives of all sentient beings and reduce our impact on climate change? I'm sure so so the question it. is, veganism, is it an evolutionary... Um, uh, is it a step in evolution? Is it, is it an evolutionary oh, dead end? Or is it a dead end? You mean ve uh, going totally yes, vegetable? Yes, e eating a diet that contains no animal products. Veganism, yeah. Um, I, well, I'd like to be one, but I haven't got the self-discipline. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, uh, no, I don't think we have to uh, be vegan right away. I believe that it's going to be possible uh, within a fairly short time uh, by, um, um, by genetic modifications and even the creation of new organisms, which soon will be a reality, uh, to create food with uh, much uh, better uh, quality than ordinary food we have. But uh, I wouldn't then include that sort of uh, increase of the world food supply, either vegan or non-vegan. Um, but I'd be much more interested. I, I re you know, you, want, you see clearly that what I'm doing is evading your question. <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, I, I, uh, of course, it would be good if we could do it and healthy. What's your opinion? <laughs> I like burgers as well. And that is the vegetables we eat, the vegetative matter. Uh, is worldwide uh, almost entirely dependent on about 20 species of plants. And astonishingly, these are mostly the species our Neolithic ancestors picked up on almost by an accident 10,000 years ago with the invention of agriculture. So we've improved these particular species, but the fact is that out of the 375 or so thousand species of plants on Earth, uh, somewhere in the vicinity of 50,000, 50,000 have been estimated as potential plant, uh, food plants. Uh, we need a revolution in agrobiology uh, to start producing new vegetable products and looking for genes that would vastly expand the capacity of our conventional product. So that might be the way to reach the goal of veganism. And you know, one that's both interesting and tasty. <laughs> <laughs> yes, sir. Um, I have a question here. The, um, I'm intrigued. I'm, I'm intrigued by the, uh, the collective consciousness of ants and, and other social insects and see it as a, 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 a sense of collective identity, maybe even a sense of oneness. And I was wanting to know your opinion about the uh, similar kinds of consciousness in interspecies collaborations or bio-community collaborations, and whether or not that kind of sense of, of collective understanding and, and action is something humans should strive for beyond their own species. Well, um, these social insects that are so successful uh, are that way because they have evolved so that their instincts uh, are yoked and coordinated and they can respond as a group very fast to particular exigencies, hunger, uh, flooding, whatever. And it's been a lot of fun to find out just how they do it experimentally in the lab, what the, how they communicate and, uh, and, do, and, uh, and act fast as a colony. Uh, uh, but they are probably are the ultimate in what animal groups have been able to achieve. And I don't know whether that's the answer of your question. I don't think there's a, much room for uh, evolution. How, uh, further evolution, if, if you even wanted to see it happen, uh, what has happened is that computer uh, experts, theorists, planners have made a good use of ant colonies 
as models for new forms of computation. Okay. Let me go over here now. I think I, I read something that you had written online and it, was, it really struck me and I just wanted to ask it again, get some clarification. I believe that, that you s stated from a, a socio-biological perspective that uh, we believe that we, and a, on a personal level, we believe and feel we have free will. And I'm not sure if you said this or not, but uh, however, from a higher perspective, maybe from a yeah. high, social, uh, socio-biological higher perspective that we in fact, it's kind of illusory that we may not in fact really have free will, but instead we're, what, what we think is free will is actually uh, making decisions w within a fairly predictable parameters. Is, could you comment on that? And well, that's not a question, but I'll tell you that uh, well, I, I, do, I do, in the, the book we're talking about tonight, I take up the question of free will. And um, I would go uh, into it, but we don't have the time, and I don't want to stir any unnecessary resentment. <laughs> in the <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. I'll get the book. All right. Okay. All right. What's your question here? Um, in your delineating the various development stages of the human, one of the things you mentioned was the development of our emotions, and uh, we were still pretty primitive. Um, but that made me wonder, do ants have emotions? Do ants react emotionally? Say it again for do me. Do ants have emotions? Do they react emotionally? Uh, the only thing I would call as an obviously expressed emotion on the part of ants is anger. <laughs> they really, uh, they have alarm substances that they release when you disturb the nest. And um, uh, you're, if you want to use the word emotion, it's hard. They're, they really are almost automata. But if you want to look for an emotion, it would be in this frenzied uh, sort of, uh, what's the, uh, the right word, um, the Viking uh, the violent warriors. Berserker. Yeah, it's sort of like that. I sort of give you a feel that maybe anger is something they, uh, they feel. I don't know. I think actually uh, emotion uh, of uh, the level we experience it all the time is, is negligent or almost absent in an insect. Yeah. Over here. Um, is the essential role of social biology and nature's deeper laws underappreciated in the major disciplines of human endeavor, such as geopolitical issues and economics? Can, can, I couldn't quite hear you either. Could you? Sorry, we're up here for a little bit. Is the essential role of social biology and nature's deeper laws underappreciated in the major disciplines of human endeavor? such as geopolitical issues and economics. Did no, you get that? and uh, I frankly often, the fact that uh, economics in particular has remained innocent of biology uh, and the thing <laughs> makes me wonder about the soundness of setting up a Nobel Prize in economics. <laughs> <laughs> How about over here? Uh, Dr. Wilson, I'm wondering if you could talk about religion and how that might have been part of human evolution, you know, ritual, song, dance, that sort of thing. The question is about religion. Yeah. And um, its role in human evolution. Its role in is it human part evolution. Of who we are? Is there a religion gene? I mean, I know you have strong opinions about this, Ed, uh, so actually, how about it? Yeah, well, um, the question is, is there a, um, a genetic propensity to uh, form religions and, and faith? And uh, the answer is, yeah, there's a whole new subject now that's developed. As, uh, it's um, the, um, uh, what's the term for it? It's, uh, well, it's uh, religion, uh, genetics of religion, with uh, studies being made at a neurobiological level and also uh, the genetic level to show that there is a genetic propensity that varies among people to affiliate with 
and uh, participate more in one in a faith than others. Uh, that's emerging, yeah. I don't know if that was the answer to your question. I think that's the answer. You also sometimes have some opinions about faith and how it's the role may be playing in allowing progress or impeding progress now, true? Well, um, yeah, I, I've, I've interpreted faith, you know, the cre a creation story, as I just mentioned, um, as um, a form of tribalism. And that is absolutely fundamental in human behavior, is to form groups in a tribal fashion so that you unite uh, within other, with others by submission to uh, a particular creation story uh, and supernatural history uh, that favors that group you belong to. And that's typical tribal behavior. And it's extremely valuable in a Darwinian sense because it, it certainly allows you to immensely increase your strength as an individual to belong to a group like that. But the problem with it is that all these faiths, as I mentioned, are in constant competition. And uh, there, in various periods of history, virtually every faith has um, engaged in some kind of war, frequently genocidal in nature, uh, because against other faiths, you know, tribe versus tribe, for heaven's sake. Uh, we're getting Buddhist extremists driving the Muslims out of, out of Myanmar now. Uh, and uh, it's clearly a source, it's a, it's a drag. Um, I think that we, and when we talk about religion, it's much more profitable and inspiriting to talk about transcendental qualities of religion that are what you might call theological. The big questions, uh, is there a God? Uh, is there life after death of any form? These are questions everybody cares about and you can carry on a civil conversation and you can explore them in depth and we'll understand them better and better uh, the more we learn about the action of the brain. But I would personally like to see the shrinking of the power of faith because I think faith, you know, creation story based, tribal, uh, is, uh, has hijacked religion. And it's, it's a uh, negative, well, you don't have to approve that, but I, uh, I think it's a drag. It's gonna be increasingly a drag on making the major types of changes we need uh, with reference to the environment and finding universal peace, of making a kind of agreements we have to make with one another across uh, nations, and groups that have different faiths. Uh, I think we have time for one more question. So it goes to the anti-dinosaur person here. No, no, that's no raptors. It's not yes. anti-dinosaur. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> First of all, I wanted to thank you for your writing. I've always appreciated it. And your, the, the warmth and your enthusiasm has really carried through for quite a long time. Um, and I wondered, when you were first a scientist, compared to where you are now, has your motivations or what drives you, has that changed over time as well? Because it seemed like in the start you were, I don't know, the eureka moment kind of may have been driving you, but I don't want to put words in your mouth. <laughs> and so what, has anything changed in that respect? I'm a little hard. So the, qu the question is, have your motivations in your science shifted over time? Correct. What drives you? What drives you? And has that changed over time? Yeah. Has what's driven you changed over time? Um, I, I think that uh, I've always been interested in discoveries. A scientist is someone who makes discoveries. That's incidentally, that's an important distinction uh, to be made between journal, scientific, science journalist, it's a noble profession, badly needed, but we have a tendency, we see a tendency in some science journalists to be speaking more and more as scientists, you know, because uh, I think the scientists themselves have the fingertip familiarity through the experience of countless failed experiments and, and auxiliary information they pick on and so on, that they ought to be the ones that say what 
looks like is emerging as, uh, as factual, not the journalist. They should report. Uh, but a scientist is to be defined as a person who has made a scientific discovery. You should be able for every real scientist to say he or she has discovered that and then complete the sentence. A uh, great scientist is one that's made great discoveries. They may, they may be completely, complete idiots <laughs> and, and unable, you know, to get along with anyone else and really not know much of anything about the field in which they made the discovery, the great discovery. But they are great scientists. That's the important thing to keep in mind, I think, when dealing with scientists. They're a very peculiar bunch of people. Thank you all for coming. Thanks so much to Chip Giller and for, to Grist for their support of tonight's